So I started out thinking I'd put together a quick video about the NLRB to coincide with Labor Day and start my series of videos in which I cover a wide variety of topics and relate them to Discordian and Anarchist theory in general and Operation Mindfix in particular. And now I find myself sitting here a month later with so much material that it would take a full semester college course to cover everything, which I'd be unqualified to teach even if I could get it approved. So I'm instead going to do a subseries on the history of labor, and this is going to be the first video in that subseries. Let me go ahead and give you my relevant credentials. I'll have my sources in the description. The eschaton is imminent, but I cannot succinctly say what that means or what we should do about it. This gives me the opportunity to continue making videos potentially in perpetuity, which I hope will be good for me from the standpoints of both financial security and an ongoing sense of fulfillment. One thing I can say is it is no longer the time for us Discordians to stick apart. Now it is the time for us to stick together and stick apart. It is time for us and for everyone to organize and disorganize. We need organized chaos, chaotic organization, and I don't really need to mention chaotic chaos, that's going to bring itself about either way. But the way we will win will be by our ability to organize, so it should be instructive to look at past labor movements. Today we will look at the 1824 Pawtucket Mill Strike, America's first factory strike. The starting point of the strike was the Slater Mill, built in 1793 by a man named Samuel Slater, who really needs some better biographies, maybe a Behind the Bastards episode, or two, or five. And I didn't know about this guy until about a month ago, and now I could talk about him for hours. A few of the articles I looked at called Samuel Slater the father of the Industrial Revolution, and that is an accurate name for him, uh, although most of the articles were calling him that as if it was a good thing. He ended up owning a few cotton mills, but the Slater mill was his first mill, and it was the first textile mill to be uh, completely water-powered. Cotton requires a humid environment, so being water-powered is a pretty obvious idea. But uh, he wasn't the first to try water powering it, he was just the first to figure out how to actually get it working. Cotton mills do a whole bunch of different complex tasks, and I'm not an expert, I don't know all the details, but hooking a dam up to a bunch of different machines is not easy when you haven't figured out that everything is just a primitive type of bending and you can just power a bunch of bending units to get everything done. Despite the ingenuity involved, his mill and the dam that powered it were not very popular. The dam had a lot of environmental impacts, and people were not fond of his labor practices even then. In a better world, this would have prevented him from being able to get a workforce or be successful, and maybe the mill would have gone to the people and been run as a collective. However, there were a few factors that allowed him to succeed. As you may be able to simply recite from your high school history class, in 1789 Eli Whitney invented the French Revolution, or maybe it was the mechanical cotton gin. This made the process of ginning cotton about 50 times as fast as it had been before. Once cotton has been ginned, the rest of the work gets done at a cotton mill. This meant that there was a sudden increase in the amount of cotton that was available for millers to mill. The land of New England is not great for farming, so the main industries were fishing, whaling, and cutting down the forest to make boats. So very much a sea-based economy. And at this time, Britain was still pretty upset about that whole Revolutionary War thing. And the British Royal Navy was just the best navy in the world at the time. And they were also dealing with the aftermath of the French Revolution and were not on great terms with France. And they didn't like that the U.S. wasn't stopping trading with France. 
So they were doing a lot of blockading of the United States, using Canada as like a naval base to resupply their ships, uh, which made whaling and fishing a lot harder uh, for the U.S. The U.S. tried imposing tariffs to counteract this, uh, which drove up the price of domestic textiles. These blockades were eventually one of the major factors leading to the War of 1812. So overall, cotton supplies were way up, textile demand was way up, and the economy of New England, which was based on fishing and whaling, was in the tanker because they just couldn't go out to sea very uh, as easily. Early on, Slater only hired children, seven to 13 years old. He would target the extremely poor families and he'd get these kids to work 12 hours a day, 16 in the summer. Uh, even at the time, there was a bunch of backlash to this. People were mostly okay with children helping out with chores and doing some farm work or learning the family trade and helping out, like sort of starting an apprenticeship, that sort of thing. Uh, but the sort of work you do in a factory where it's, uh, you know, it's humid, um, but also it's very dangerous. You know, you have these fast moving belts, but also fast moving threads and textiles. One thing I specifically remember learning way back in high school history is that the thread in a textile mill is spun, uh, is spinning and moving at such a high speed that if you are were to try to touch a piece of thread that's going between two machines, uh, it would cut straight through your finger like a bandsaw. Now, I don't have a source for this, but mm, I get the feeling that Mr. Slater was probably not all that keen on safety regulations or anything of that sort either. After a bit, he starts getting upset that he just can't get enough child workers to fully staff his mills. It seems like there's always a labor shortage. His mills are profitable, so he just builds some more, and and so do some of his buddies in the area with the means to do so. And they could take in a bunch of cotton to process, so the plantations keep increasing their land use to grow more cotton, and they bring in more slaves because they're also having trouble keeping up with the labor short needed for the production that they want. And can you believe it? This drives more mills to be built which drives the plantations to grow more cotton, and the labor market just can never seem to keep up with the need for infinite growth. It's just so frustrating. Why does this happen? It's a mystery. It's almost like the planet has a large amount of resources, and the primary limiting factor on overall production is labor. So in order to prevent us from overproducing until it kills us, we need to reduce the amount of labor that capital has access to. Nobody wants to work anymore. I think that's a good thing. But there are children that are deserting his workforce and they aren't there aren't enough joining. So he starts hiring whole families. He sets them up in company provided housing and makes them shop at the company store. And he even allows them to take Sundays off so that they can attend the church and the Sunday school that he sponsors. And they can learn about the great virtues of hard work and always obeying authority. The mill owners also bring in some police forces in 1814. And a decade later, they're going to implement night watches to prevent troublemakers from organizing. A little bit of foreshadowing there. Uh, the whole thing gives me the, you know, real M. Night Shyamalan's The Village energy. So all these institutions, you know, the company-run housing, the company-run market, you got the company-run church, you got the company-run police force, all of these 
things that are part of our traditional values. The so, so stuff that this guy, Sam Slater, just loved. Uh, and he brought them to the people to get them to work harder for him. Uh, the people weren't nearly as pious and uptight as Slater wanted them to be. Uh, they may have been scheduled for ungodly many hours, but they often showed up late. They would hold festivals. They'd find ways to get around any attempts to prohibit alcohol. Things would get stolen from the mills. Things would get sabotaged. A few mills were arsoned. Uh, in other words, the mill workers did not become the docile, stiff, no-nonsense automatons that the manga types claim that we need to return to. Uh, when the mills started using power looms around 1810, there was a shift in the labor force because children just couldn't handle the raw power of a power loom. So the mills were hiring fewer children, by which I mean that the workforce went from being 70% children to being 40% children. So, you know, still a really heavy amount of child labor involved. Uh, the remainder was pretty evenly split between men and women, both before and after this shift. Uh, but the men typically were doing the higher paid skilled labor, uh, whereas the women were doing lower paid, um, quote unquote, unskilled labor, let's say. Um... But on May 24th of 1824, all the Pawtucket mill owners decided to try and weaponize this uh, gender split. Uh, they, of course, were colluding. Uh, I mean, this is before the Sherman Antitrust Act by quite a bit. Um, but they uh, tried to enact a policy where just for the women, the workday would be increased by one hour per day and the pay would be decreased by 25%. Uh, note, they were not being paid hourly. They were being paid weekly or something along those lines. And the justification they wanted to give was that the women were already being paid too much and that the work that they were doing was just women's work. You know, that sort of thing. Basically, they thought they could just be like, Eh, hey, fellows, here's a way to get your women back in line. And the fellows would go with them, and the women would just kind of follow along because that's the patriarchy. But the goddess was with them that day. So when the bell rang out the Slater Mill on May 26th, 102 of the women working there, as well as some of the other co-workers and community members, blocked the entrance. The women held a meeting, and they determined that they weren't going to go back to work until the decision was reversed. There were protests for a week, with workers at other mills joining in, blocking those mills, as well as gathering outside the owners' houses, hurling rocks and insults through the windows. A week after the strike started, one of the mills was set on fire. Uh, the day after that happened, the bosses relented and the mills were able to reopen on June 3rd, uh, just a week and a day after the uh, strike had started. And from this we get a very simple lesson. The capitalists are terrified of organized labor. They will do everything they can to stop it. But the only weapon they have is money. They will buy, or they will try to buy, politicians, government agencies, police forces, religions, media agencies, celebrities, influencers, advertisements, pizza parties. But people are realizing more and more that the rules are made up and the points don't matter. Once the pieces are in place, we will perform the ritual and we will cast the spell of disbelief on the money and it will disappear. The bosses are right to fear our collective action because the goal of collective action is to stop the exploitation and without exploitation, 
they are no better than anyone else. And for them, that's the scariest idea of all. It would really help me out if you would like, subscribe, click the bell, leave a comment, you know, all the YouTube things. Let me know what I could improve. What do you want to see more of? What did you like? Maybe I'll listen to it. Maybe I'll even reply. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash omniliquid. I'll leave a link in the description. If you want to support me there, that would be wonderful. You know the deal with it being totally optional and all that, and so far the only reward planned is your name in the credits. I will never hide content behind a paywall if I can afford not to. Thank you so much for watching, and just keep on making the world better, as I know you will.